morning, everybody. everybody. Um, Brad, it's better if you present the research. Brad? Yeah, okay, shall I start then? Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much and good morning. For, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, present my research at this um, seminar. My name is Alethea Tabor and I'm based at the Department of Chemistry at UCL. And the title of my talk is, um, yeah, so. Uh, so I'm going to talk about two stories this morning to you, and they're both based around cyclic peptides. For the last 15 years, we've been looking at cyclic peptides which have either thioether bonds between residues or cysteine disulfide um, bonds between residues. And I'm sure I don't need to tell anybody in this audience how important these are. They act as a conformational constraint, but they can all be, depending on what size of link and the conformational properties of the intermediate bond and whether or not you combine them, you can obviously get very different macrocyclic structures. So the two topics I'm going to present to you today are our st synthetic and structural studies on the lantibiotics, which have these thioether bridges in the middle of them. And then I'm going to move on to talk about some work we've been doing recently with inhibitory cysteine not toxins. Uh, and the link is how you can um, replace the disulfide bonds in the native toxins with thioether bridges. So we've been fascinated by, for many years, by a class of antimicrobial peptides called the lantibiotics. And in particular, we're interested in the lantibiotic nicin. This is a naturally occurring peptide, which is produced by Lactococcus lactis. And it's essentially a form of peptide warfare. It has antimicrobial activity against other gram-positive bacteria, and it's been used for decades as a food preservative. It's known to form pores in the bacterial plasma membrane, and when you have its target, which is lipid 2, shown here, then the minimum inhibitory concentration is much lower. Now, this is tremendously important because lipid 2 is only found in bacteria. It's not found in mammals. It's a vital part of the synthesis of the bacterial cell wall and no structural variation is permitted. So the bacterial cell wall is biosynthesized by the assembly of lipid 2 on the inner membrane, flips through to the outer membrane, and then the peptidoglycan um, is formed by cross-linking, and the um, lipid um, phosphate is recycled back to the inner membrane, and the whole process starts again. But this is the, as I said in the title, it's the Achilles heel of bacteria because they can't be doing without it. Now, nicin has a very, very interesting mode of action. What we know so far is that it has a, it forms a pore complex with lipid 2. And early work by group, the groups in Netherlands, the Netherlands showed that this was an 8 to 4 pore complex. Um, and there's a schematic of how this might work here. And very little is known, however, about how this molecular recognition might take place at the, um, at the, um, at the level of individual um, interactions. So when we, start, when we started work in this area, it was known that the C terminus of nicin could recognize the pyrophosphate part of lipid 2, and there was an NMR structure of a one-to-one -one complex between, between nicin and um, a truncated version of lipid 2, which clearly showed interactions between these rings and this pyrophosphate. And very recently, um, the, the group of Marcus Weingarth has published um, a, a paper in solid state NMR, which largely supports this um, hypothesis. He's managed to get solid state NMR of the entire complex within bacterial membranes. But we still don't have any details of what else is happening. We don't have, none of the NMR studies so far can tell us how the recognition of the sugars is taking taking place, although we know that the recognition of both the sugars 
and the pentapeptide is important, sorry, for the assembly of the pores. We also don't know what the role of the hinge region is or what the role of the C-terminus of the peptide is, other than we're pretty sure that it inserts into the membrane. So my, our motivation in my group for studying this is twofold. First of all, we want to understand more about how this complex forms. And being that we are synthetic chemists, we wanted to do this by a chemical biology approach by making subunits of niacin and looking at them in more detail. And the secondary motivation of this is that ultimately we hope that by being able to make analogues of niacin, we can make analogues which are more stable, smaller, better drug candidates, you name it. So I'll summarize the research, our earlier research in this area. We've developed solid phase peptide synthesis techniques for making thioether bridged peptides. And our early work on niacin ring C, I'm not going to describe here, or our work on the overlapping rings, but basically we've made this portion and this portion, and we've made some simplified hybrid antibiotics, but I'm not gonna talk about those this morning to you. What I want to talk to you about um, in the first half of this lecture is our synthetic and structural studies on ring A, ring B, which you'll recollect are the parts which recognize the pyrophosphate. And the questions we really want to ask are, we've got a small peptide, how does it recognize a large lipid with such selectivity and assemble into such stable pores? Can we, via analog synthesis, understand these factors? And one thing we were particularly interested in was to see whether or not the individual rings were already pre-organized for binding to lipids too. And it turns out that niacin has very many other members of its extended family. As of when I published the papers two years ago, these were all the niacin-like peptides that were known. And you can see that they all have a ring A and ring B structure. There's very little variation in the other amino acids, particularly in ring B. And ring B is almost always methylanthionine, proline, glycine, with the exception of one niacin analogue, mutacin 1, um, where you have a lanthionine residue. And these are all naturally occurring peptides. These are all ones which have been evolved by producing organisms to also bind lipid 2, and we believe also to have an antibacterial effect this way. So we were asking ourselves, what are the key residues in this structure which allow binding to lipid 2 pyrophosphate? And ultimately, can we simplify this structure? And very early work uh, in the field by structural biologists showed that there might be a degree of pre-organization. If you look at the solution structure from 30 years ago, you only see one ring B conformer, Although when you synthesize individual ring B analogs, you get two conformational step, um, states out of this. So how do we actually go about making a antibiotic by solid phase peptide synthesis? Well, let's start with the smallest of these rings. What we've developed over the years is a synthesis of orthogonally protected lanthionines, and we use these in, as monomers in our conventional peptide synthesis. And you'll see that one end of the lanthionine is protected with conventional FMOC, and the other end is protected with protecting groups which are orthogonal to both FMOC and to the acid label terbutyl um, um, protecting groups that you have on the side chains of your other amino acids. So for this example, we use a low loading resin. We can put the first two amino acids on by entirely um, standard techniques and extend our peptide such that we get a linear sequence. 
Now, what we want to do here now is close the ring. That's what we're aiming for. So we can remove the FMOC group. We can remove the silar protecting groups. These ones are removable by tetrabutyl ammonium fluoride. And that gives us a peptide which we can cyclize on the resin using pi AOP. We then have a peptide where if we wish to, we can do further chain extension or we can remove the peptide from the, ring, from the resin to give us our cyclic peptide. So we found this to be a very powerful method of making lanthionine containing peptides. And we've gone through and made a whole bunch of ring B type structures, which I'll show you presently. We could also use this methodology to make our ring A structures, but here we had the additional challenge of needing to make dehydroalanine structures. And if I just zoom in on this, there's the dehydroalanine, and we also wanted dehydrobutyrene structures if we were going to look at nicin, or just dehydroalanine if we were going to look at mutasin. We also wanted to ask ourselves, frankly, are these, are these residues needed? Um, because the aim, at the back of our minds, we've had the whole time, can we make these simpler and stabler? The problem with having dehydro residues is that it makes the um, structure um, unstable, particularly towards nucleophilic attack or towards acid. And also, as you'll see, they're a bit fiddly to make. We also wanted to know, is this last part of the sequence absolutely necessary? So we've been making analogues which have the biosynthetic precursor in, and we've also been making saturated analogues of these structures. But first of all, how do we make the dehydroalanine residues? Well, we tried a lot of literature methods and the only one that worked was one from Mike Webb's group a couple of years ago, in which we form our peptide with three cysteines at the point where we want to introduce our dehydroalanines. And then this dibromide is coupled. You get a, uh, bromo you get a sulfonium ion and that can be easily eliminated to give you your, your dehydro structure. So we've tried this on model peptides, and we're delighted to say that it also works in our cyclic A-ring peptides to give us our dehydroalanine structures. We're also delighted to say that if you start with a methyl cysteine of the correct stereochemistry, then the sulfonium ion will eliminate via an E2 process to give you the right stereochemistry around the DHB residue. And we've proved that by checking the NOE between that and the next amide. And so we could use this to uh, make wild type nicin ring A with the correct stereochemistry here. Okay, so our ring B peptides, we then analyzed by standard NMR techniques in collaboration with, with Fleming Hansen's group at um, UCL. And what we found was that the mutasin ring B structures had, whoops, interconverting conformers around this bond. And the minor conformer was the one that corresponded to the structure that, um, um, that had been disclosed by the group in the Netherlands um, 10 years previously, which was a bit confusing. The nicin ring bin structures were even more confusing because we could only see one conformer which didn't correspond to the one WCO structure. And furthermore, we tried this with both methyl group here, which is the wild type structure and with the lanthionine analog, and we could still only see the cis conformer, which was very confusing. The ring A peptide structure, however, was a lot less confusing. First of all, gratifyingly, you can replace the dehydroalanine here with 
the methyl group and the ring conformation is exactly the same. Also, the ring, uh, the ring conformation is exactly the same as seen in the NMR structure. And it's pretty similar between niacin and mutasin. What we also see is that um, mucin and niacin have got very similar conformations, implying they may have the same mode of recognition. But truncation, we know that truncation at the end terminus of niacin abolishes activity. So does this imply that ring A is already in the right shape for binding to limit two? It could be. We basically just docked in the pyrophosphate and it did look like it was the right shape. So now we wanted to do something really quite sophisticated. We wanted to make analogues with two lanthionine rings in them. So using our previously described technology, we can make ring B. And as I said before, the way we make ring B sets up the end terminus for coupling the next amino acid. So here what we want to do as we've got two consecutive lanthionine bridges is we want to add the next orthogonally protected lanthionine and then incorporate the next set of residues to form this linear sequence. Now what we want to do is what we did for the single ring, and again, remove these protecting groups, remove the FMOC protecting group and cyclize. So removing the protecting groups was no problem, but we tried absolutely everything and we could not initially get any sign of ring closing. Double coupling didn't work. We tried every solvent in the laboratory. We tried microwave conditions. We tried pre-organizing with um, HMB amino acids where we've got protecting groups on the amides, try and curve it around. Nothing worked. And it was fairly obvious that whatever confirmation this was on on the resin, the end terminus and the um, the C term, the end terminus here and the carboxylic acid that we wanted to couple to were just poles apart. So what we did instead was to bias the conformation of the um, a ring by inserting a pseudoproline. And this was great because, of course, we've got a serine here. So we put um, the serine isoleucine unit in as a pseudoproline. Then we were able to remove the protection groups as seen previously. And now, gratifyingly, when we did the, when we did the cyclization, we got amide bond formation. We were then to aim, able to add the N-terminal amino acids, cleave everything from the resin, cleave off the protecting groups, and we needed TMFSA to get the, um, um, the aminal structure um, broken down. But we got a small but significant um, yield of this is ring A, ring B, and what we've got are the, uh, we've got analogues where we've got a hydroxy here and a threonine here, rather than the dehydro structures. Okay, so what have we managed to do? This is the structure I just showed you. We've made this synthetically. We also managed to make a very, very low yield of this one. Now we couldn't use a pseudoproline approach here, so we got a very poor amide bond coupling and a very uh, and we basically didn't make enough for structural analysis. And we need to go back and focus on this because if we can get a structural analysis of this, this is greatly simplified. But we wanted to compare what we'd made with the wild type. And the best way to make the wild type turns out to be by a trypsin digestion of purified wild type niacin. And Rob Liskamp's group, also in the Netherlands, had published this a couple of years ago. And we've got a really reliable method for making this. But to our amazement, whoops, sorry, nobody had actually 
done the NMR on this vital part on its own. People had only ever done the NMR of the complete peptide. Now, my group are not expert in NMR by any manner of means. So at this point, we turned to uh, Marte Erdeli at the University of Uppsala, and I got a travel grant for my students to go out and work on some NMR studies with uh, Marte and his group. So the structures I showed you earlier were all the sort of conventional structures you would expect. You take a um, you take a cyclic peptide, you put it in D2O or D2O with some buffer or H2O with water suppression, and you get an ensemble average of all of the possible um, conformers. And that's usually what people publish, and that's what we published for the single rings. But we were interested, and we'd had some discussions with Marte and his group, to see what the conformers which make up that ensemble average actually were because we had a suspicion that there might be conformers which were pre-organized for binding and conformers which were not. Unfortunately, Marte has developed this technique called NAMFIS, which stands for an NMR analysis of molecular flexibility in solution. And that gives you the, uh, the percentage population of all conformations present in solution. And you'll see this in the examples we've done. So what it means is you, you do what you would normally do to solve an NMR structure and you have a bunch of NOEs, but not all the structures will satisfy, will be, uh, um, will, will have, will, will correspond to all of those NOEs. And what you get out of this is all the major confirmations that are present in solution rather than an average solution. Now, I don't pretend to understand the NMR software on this, but this was the result that we got. So this is our wild type nicin 1 to 12. And what you can see here are the relative amounts of the various conformers in here. And I've highlighted the B ring. And these two turn out to be very, very similar, conformations three and four. And these make up half of the total solution conformations. However, the biologically active conformation, the conformation which is closest to the previously determined lipid binding structure turns out to be a, a relatively minor component. It turns out to be only 26% of the population. And the only difference, major difference between these turns out to be the conformation around the central amide bond between rings A and ring B. In the individual rings, Conformations of ring A and ring B are similar. So in the major conformer, you get ring B and ring A pointing away to each other. And in the lipid two binding structure, the two rings turn around to make like a pyrophosphate binding cage. What about our lanthionine analog, the antibiotic analog with the serine and the threonine. Well, here we got only five possible conformers and none of these structures were similar to the one that bound lipid two. One of them is similar to the most populated wild type. So why don't we get the lipid two bound conformation? Well, that we think is because there's the possibility of an additional hydrogen bond between this OH, which shouldn't be here, um, which isn't here in the wild type, and the N terminus. And we think that stabilizes the wrong fold with the two rings pointing away from each other. Now, that's an interesting point because there are mutants of the nicin family which actually have serine here, which do have a degree of biological activity. So we need to think about where that comes from. OK, so that sums up that part of the story. And we're now working on larger 
nice in analogues where we've got more of the rings in place and we're starting to look at um, putting these together in planar bilayers and looking at the biophysics of what's going on. But our summary is basically we can make these lanthionine containing peptides. Some of the rings of nicin are pre organized for binding to the target. Some of them are not. They may you know, form a lock and key type structure. We can start to dissect out what the effect of the individual amino acid substitutions is on the um, conformation and on the binding ability. Importantly, the dehydroamino acids may not be crucial for lipid 2 binding. And for the N terminus, there's a crucial amide bond flexibility, which allows for the binding to the pyrophosphate. So moving on to the other story I wanted to talk to you about. This may not at first sight seem related, but bear with me. One of the hot areas in cyclic peptide chemistry at the moment, and again, as I'm sure you're well aware, is looking at toxins which have an ICK or inhibitory cysteine knot motif. And these are very prevalent in spider toxins, in cone toxins, and so forth. And what you can see is they have a characteristic connectivity. They have three disulfide, three disulfide bonds, six cysteines, and they tend to be connected together one to four, two to five, and three to six. And um, these are what I call the linear ICK motifs. They can also get head to tail cyclized ones, which David Craik and his, um, and his collaborators have worked on very extensively, but I'm not going to talk about um, these today. We're, not, we're only interested at the moment in the linear ones. Now, why is everybody interested in these? Everybody's interested in these because they have, um, because their targets are ion channels. And the particular one we're interested in, um, Protox2, is a very selective and very potent inhibitor of the sodium 1.7 channel. Now, the sodium 1.7 channel is the one that you need to um, find antagonists of if you want to treat chronic pain for cancer patients or people with you know, extensive burns or whatever. Um, it's a it's something that, you know, it's a, it's a um, receptor found in the peripheral nervous system. Of course, the problem with trying to find selective antagonists against sodium channels is there's a whole family of very similar sodium channels, small molecule inhibitors that tend, antagonists rather, tend to hit all of them without discrimination. So that's why there's been so much um, interest in these cyclic peptide toxins. And indeed, there is one cyclic peptide toxin, Prealt, which is already in the clinic for use for chronic pain. The big problem with these things is that they don't cross the blood nerve barrier. So pre-out has to be um, injected into the spine to have its analgesic effect, which is not great. So what we wanted to do, because our lab had developed the method of replacing cysteine-cysteine bridges by thioether bridges, we of course wanted to ask the question, what happens if we put a lanthionine bridge into Protox2? And we'd rather hoped that we would get something which had a greater stability. It certainly would be resistant to any form of reduction. And we thought it might possibly have also potency, modified potency, greater potency, possibly improved pharmacokinetics. And we thought also it would be nice to start an investigation as to whether or not truncated structures had antagonist anti activity. As you will shortly see, this turned into a um, it, it turned into an interesting story, and it turned into a story investigating how these ICK peptides actually fold. Now, why is this not a totally silly idea? It's not a totally silly idea because twenty years ago, thirty years ago, now Murray Goodman and uh, Wolfram van der Donk and so and other people had actually started to look at whether or not you can make 
lanthionine analogs of cysteine, of cyclic pep, cysteine um, cyclic peptides. So things like somatostatin, sandostatin, enkephalin, and so forth had been successfully bridged with lanthionine bridges. So this same seemed like it seemed like a, a possible anyway. This time we wanted to use the same solid phase peptide synthesis approach that we'd used before, but one thing I didn't emphasize is in the antibiotics, it's an RS, SR lanthionine. Here we wanted to use an RR lanthionine so that we were similar to the RR cysteine that you get naturally. So there's protox two, what do we want to do? Well, we wanted to look at single rings, partly because we wanted to see, you know, can we make single rings which have any degree of potency? And partly because, of course, we wanted some control peptides, which might be easier to um, synthesize first time round. So we wanted to make the... Um, We wanted to make individual cyclic peptides corresponding to the, let me see, that's the 3, 6, the 2, 5, and the 1, 4 bridged peptides. And we wanted to make them both lanthionine bridged, and we wanted to make them cysteine disulfide bridged as controls. And we felt this was important because, to be quite frank, nobody we and nobody else had made lanthionine bridged um, structures this big before. OK, but the exciting thing was that we wanted to make the whole molecule with individual lanthionine bridges, either the 1,4, the 2,5 or the 3,6. So to cut a long story short, because time is um, our enemy here, we managed to make the single rings via the methodology I've just described fairly easily. But making the complete peptides turned out to be slightly more difficult. Just making the linear peptide, incorporating the lanthionine and cyclizing, we were getting a lot of truncation sequences. So eventually what we had to do was to resort to using HMB protection to prevent our peptide folding on resin. And this is a standard approach, as you know, to the synthesis of difficult peptides. Incorporating HMB um, protected monomers actually worked quite well. So we were able to set up our linear peptide. This is the one with the, this is going to be the one with the bridge between the three and six positions. So with our linear peptide in hand, we were able to remove the orthogonal protecting groups. Here we're using allyl and alloc as our protecting group. So we were able to use palladium tetrachystraphene or phosphine to um, remove these and then cyclize on resin. So standard SPPS then extended the sequence. You can then cleave from the resin and then aerial oxidation, we believe, put in the other two bridges. That worked very well for one of the other peptides, the one with the N-terminal lanthionine bridge, didn't work so well for the one with the bridge in the middle. So what we had to do here was to set this up with orthogonal protecting groups on the cysteine that could be selectively removed with DTT whilst on the resin and then oxidized with NCS on the resin and then cleavage followed by aerial oxidation gave us our peptide D with the bridge in the middle. So we were terribly excited. We managed to make half a milligram of each of these three peptides and we also had a case full of single ring peptides. And we, after 
we, we managed to find excellent collaborators at a company called Besis in um, Switzerland, and we shipped these all off to um, Switzerland. They had a assay, um, trans stably transfected cell lines expressing the human NAV 1.7 receptor, automated throughput patch clamp assay, and what you see, here's the control. Normally you see, it's basically an electrophysiology um, type thing. You see um, the voltage going down and up if, you're, if your pore isn't blocked. And if your pore is blocked, you don't see anything. So this is very lovely. Unfortunately, but we weren't very surprised, all our single rings were completely inactive. So all of these that we'd made with lanthionine or the cysteine, none of them worked. So that was disappointing, but not terribly surprising. What we were very gutted about was that our three major peptides with our lanthionine bridges in them were also all completely inactive. So we were very, very disappointed about this. But we were also a little bit startled because, of course, we'd also sent over to Switzerland a control peptide. Now, Zoe, the student doing this, had made lots of linear, linear protox, and she'd investigated various ways of cyclizing these. And we had limited mass spec available to us at the time. And she found that just stir stirring in water, oxygen, seven days, that seemed to produce a high yield of what we assumed was our fully cyclized peptide. We sent that over and it was inactive as well. Okay, I said, you, know, you, must, have, you must have made a mistake. Let's just buy some and send some over. So we bought some from Sigma Aldrich, which we sent it over, and that also didn't produce any results in the assay. So we tried another company, um, which I can very much recommend, Smartox in France, and we sent their compound over, and that was active. And Zoe went back to the lab and tried a different set of um, oxidation conditions using glutathione reduced and oxidized in buffer over a 24 hour period a redox equilibration conditions and got an active sample. So what's going on here? Well, we ought to have been more alive to this initially, but our mass spec experiments looked good. But we then took our different peptides, both the commercially two commercially available samples and so is samples made by two different means and put them down in HPLC. And they were very clearly two different peptides. We went over to the biochemistry department to Professor Costas Thalassinos' lab and said, you've got a much better mass spec than us. Can you have a look at this for us? So on his nano electrospray, he had a look at it and looked at the various charge states. And basically this one, whoops, this one, the 24 hour one, is just one single peptide with all the cysteines oxidized. But this one, which looks like a single peak on HPLC, turns out to be a mixture of partially oxidized and fully reduced peptides. And when Costas looked more carefully at this, um, we were actually all very alarmed. So this is the one which was oxidized under the redox equilibrating conditions. And that genuinely is one peptide. And as you'll see in a minute, it's genuinely the right one. This is the one that's active. But the one which was oxidized under kinetic oxidation conditions, just with aerial oxidation, was at least three species, none of which was completely cyclized. In parallel with this, another student in my group, Stephen McCarthy, had the opportunity to go over to Tamir Gonan's laboratory in, um, in the States and do some crystallographic analysis of this. We were really rather hoping he would get something in a membrane, which he didn't, but what he did 
get was a very nice um, x-ray crystal structure of this, which clearly showed the disulfide bonds were in the right places. And it clearly showed that the thing folded very similarly to the NMR structure. So that was good. Okay, so we've had more of an investigation of this since we published the first paper. And we thought, well, how do these linear ICK peptides fold? And by linear, I mean, they're not N C, N to C cyclized. So there are two hypotheses in the literature. One is that as you stir these, the correct connectivity forms, and then another disulfide forms with the connect connectivity, and then the final bridge forms. And all folding intermediates have the native connectivity. And there's a number of peptides for which this appears to be the case. This is one example, EETI, where unfolding um, studies gave fairly strong evidence that this might be the case. But that's not necessarily what's happening, and it's clearly not what's happening in our case. The other hypothesis currently in the literature is that you go from your linear peptide to a bunch of singly bridged peptides, which may or may not have native cysteine cysteine connectivity. And then there's an equilibrium between those, the linearized ones, um, ones with two um, disulfides, and that they, as these things fold, some of these get trapped in unproductive folding pathways, and some of them can rearrange to give you the, com the um, complete folding pathway. Now, most of the studies that have so far been done have been done by people taking the completely folded peptide and partially unfolding it um, and seeing how it folded up again um, and doing uh, simulations. But we were keen to see if we could do this in the other direction, particularly now we had access to um, some very sophisticated mass spectrometry. So what we've recently done is looked at this over a time course. So this is our kinetic fold, folding pathway, no equilibration possible. And you can see that over the seven day period, we never completely lose the linear structure and we build up a horrendous mess, quite frankly, of partially folded um, structures with one or two um, disulfides. The two we managed to resolve are these ones A and B here. Um, and this is, the, um, this is the peaks as they came off the LCMSMS. And Stephen, the student in my group, was able to get MSMS of two of these intermediates. This one turned out to have the non-natural uh, bridge between cysteines three and four. And this one, turned out to have the bridge between cysteines five and six. Now you'll see from the chromatogram that there are a lot of two bridge structures which we didn't manage to resolve. There's probably some more single bridge structures that we didn't manage to resolve. Um, this is ongoing work. But based on that, we put together a preliminary hypothesis for this. Our view is that Protox, what we didn't see was any bridges at the end terminus. So our hypothesis, and it's no more than a hypothesis at this stage, is that the C terminus folds into a hairpin type structure, allowing the five to six bridge to form and not preventing the three to four bridge from forming. Once one or both of these bridges have formed, this allows a second part of the overall beta hairpin to come together and then these disulfides to rearrange. And if you look at the final crystal, st crystal structure that uh, Stephen produced, you can see this is not implausible. There's the N-terminal um, hairpin and you can see that there's a bunch of amide bonds to the next strands, which if those, if that, if if, if that brought another part of the sheet together, might allow these um, disulfide bonds to form by rearrangement. But I have to say, this is no more than a hypothesis at this point. 
So to summarise, what have we learned? Well, um, we've learned, or perhaps we ought to have discovered in the first place, that folding of this particular toxin is very dependent on the conditions used. This isn't as stupid as it might sound. Um, if you delve into the literature, you'll find that people who are making one peptide very often look at a range of oxidative conditions, and I think you can see why. But people who are making libraries of these toxins very often just do aerial oxidation without any possibility of equilibration. And we believe that by so doing, people are missing a lot of properly folded intermediates. Now, in this case, with Protox2, you definitely need a redox buffer giving you equilibration between um, correctly folded structures and incorrectly folded structures. Because if you do aerial oxidation in water, we get a number of biologically inactive peptides which are incompletely folded. And we're not sure yet whether or not these represent kinetic traps, non-productive folding pathways, or whether or not these are necessary intermediates on the folding pathway. So, can, so what is the project to success? Well, can we replace cysteine, cysteine bridges um, in um, ICK peptides with thioether bridges? Absolutely. If nothing else, we've developed some synthetic methodology. Did it work for Protox? No, not with r anthiony. There are a whole bunch of reasons why that could be. I'm happy to discuss those in a minute. Do the truncated protoxin structures have antagonist activity? Sadly not. Can we use, again, a chemical biology approach by synthesizing peptides and looking at mass spectrometry to reveal and possibly eventually direct these folding pathways and eventually get the correct disulfide connectivity of these linear ICK peptides? We believe we can, and that's ongoing work at the moment. So in my final couple of slides, I'd like to thank um, the people who have stood at the bench, stood in front of the HPLC, stood in front of the mass spectrometer and actually done this. For the ICK peptides, I've had an excellent team of four PhD students who have now finished and gone on to postdocs, um, to permanent positions um, in industry. And, and uh, Rachel Dickman has set up her own laboratory at UCL. I'd like to also thank our funders and my um, collaborators, um, particularly Costas and Tamir. And the NICIN project was the main project of Rachel Dickman, shown here. Very, very, as I said, a very, very talented PhD student in my group who's now set up her own lab and her co-worker, Serena Mitchell. It was, this part was a side project for Serena. I haven't had time to describe her project, which was also nice in related. And there's a whole bunch of previous students and postdocs and master students in my group who did all the um, setting up of the, um, of the um, synthetic methodology over many years. Very grateful to our mass spec and NMR technicians at UCL and to my collaborators, Marte and Fleming for all their help with the structural work. And finally, um, I'm lucky to work at UCL, which is in a beautiful part of London with lots of green leafy squares, wonderful Victorian architecture, more modern architecture. The chemistry department, of course, is not so beautiful. So thank you very much for listening and I'm happy, happy to take questions. Thanks so much for your presentation, in particular for you take time for ours. Um, so, someone from the audience who want to participate with the question? I take one question. Yes. Um, regarding the obtain the structure nisine is, is uh, joined with a membrane. Can solid state NMR resolution give better, res better uh, results? You, you group before uh, in, in yes. solid state? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a very good question. Let me just go back to, 
the slide. Our group um, do not do solid state NMR, but Marcus Feingrass group do quite a lot and have some very nice preliminary results. So, yep. Um, let me carry on sharing the screen. That would be, oh, here we go. So this is the recent paper by Marcus Feingarth. Um, the problem with the solid state NMR is really the resolution. What they could tell was that, um, they could tell that the um, nicin had a similar confirmation to what was seen in the earlier the, the, let me go back a stage. The earlier paper from um, the Netherlands group had um, was just a one-to-one -one mixture in DMSO, so there was no membrane involved, and these were the interactions they were able to pick out. What Feingarth's group has shown is that although the model is broadly similar, there are a lot of chemical shifts and NOEs that you actually see in the solid state structure, which are not compatible with this structure. What he can't tell us at this stage and what isn't in this nature communication paper is the fine details of, you know, where's this amide bond and, you know, what's ring C doing. And also nobody has much of an idea of the, um, nobody has much of an idea of the, um, nobody has much of an idea of what the nice and nice in interactions are like. So I'm sorry, you probably didn't see much of that. So in, to summarize, you can tell broadly speaking what's going on, but we're not, but at the moment, the solid state NMR experiments aren't able to give us this level of detail of here are hydrogen bonds, here are hydrophobic interactions, this one's near to that one, which is why we're going for a more chemical biology uh, approach. Uh, good. Hi, um, great talk. Um, I was wondering yeah. if you had any issues with the formation of uh, sulfonyl group, like like mm -hmm. on your thioester. If you had formation of uh, like sulfonyl group, it seems to be like oh, in oxi oxidated condition. That's what it would be formed, and then issue yes. of purity. Absolutely. Um, this is one of the. Um, and this is one of the um, synthetic challenges of antibiotic um, work. Both, you know, the naturally, the naturally occurring antibiotics will oxidize um, if left in air over a prolonged period of time. And our synthetic materials, they are, they are stable to the conditions under which we um, make them. But if you do a lot of manipulations with them and then look at the mass spectrometer, you see M, M plus 16, M plus 32. The first time any student makes this in my laboratory, they get a mass spec of the crude and they're very excited. And then they spend five days doing different HPLC techniques to get the right thing. And then they find that they're full of oxidized dice product. Once they have the HPLC conditions correct, then they can um, then they can get it pure. But yes, it, it is a real problem. Anyone else who would like uh, to ask? You've got one person with it, a couple of people with their hands up. Uh, I, I just want to ask if uh, any of these nice invariants, did you check uh, for antibiotic activity or are they, we, are they good or not? We haven't yet with this project. Um, the reason why we haven't with this project is that previous work in this area has, uh, and we've done some on another project, has shown that the N-terminus on its own, the A and B rings on their own, have very low antibacterial activity. So um, once we start making longer analogues, or hybrid analogues, we think we should get more antibacterial activity. But also, to be quite honest, we didn't make very much. And if it was a choice between putting it in an NMR tube and putting it in a bacterium, we chose to put it in the NMR tube. Okay. Hi, may I ask a question? Uh, thank you for the very nice, interesting uh, lecture. And um, okay. I wanted to ask if, um, in the niacin project, when when it interacts with the lipid two, is it? Yeah. If I understood correctly, 
this interaction changes the the conformation of the of the of the of the nicin. Yeah. So 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 I'm confused because uh, I understood that when you analyze all the conformation, the different conformation of the nicin, so you found that uh, only a certain uh, percentage was in a conformation which is considered uh, biologically active, right? So, yeah. So, but but it, when it, it interacts, then it may change conformation. So, so it's confusing for me to understand uh, th this statement. Uh, yeah. Okay. Just, what is considered the biologically active conformation uh, if it if the niacin is alone in, in a solution? Yes. Obviously, what we're looking at here is just the N terminus and how it um, how the conformation um, changes. And of course, we don't have the rest of the peptide there. What we're seeing here with these different um, populations is interconverting conformers. So in the total solution of this, we've got six major conformers and they're able to um, interconvert. Now, what we are hypothesizing, and we haven't done the binding stu studies that would be necessary, is that, I'll borrow my son's, um, I'll borrow my son's, um, uh, so you've got interconverting conformations, and we are hypothesizing that when they meet the lipid two, the ones which are correctly organized can bind it. And then of course the others, um, as they equilibrate towards the correct conformation, can bind too. But as I say, that is no more than a hypothesis at the moment. We've attempted to do preliminary binding studies with um, pyrophosphate mimics, but we haven't succeeded yet in um, verifying that. Okay, thank you so much. Any other question? There's one other gentleman, Felix Santana, with a hand up. Hi, thank you. A uh, great presentation. I just have uh, like one question, and um, like the sulfide-rich uh, peptides are really interesting, and they have a great potential, right? So, if we talk, if we uh, analyze uh, natural occurring peptides and we characterize them, sometimes uh, we find interesting things, and we we would like to uh, improve the activity of such peptides. And one way of doing that is by generating like a huge amount of variants with uh, single mutations in the segments. Now, uh, what are your thoughts on using these uh, system-rich peptides in that regard? Because uh, I, I am assuming that the synthesis of the peptides are really complicated and the yields are not that high, right? So uh, like, would you foresee that in the near future this this will be uh, reliable and that the uh, system rich peptides can be uh, used as uh, as candidates in clinic? Yes, that's a really good question. I'm glad you asked that. There's two ways of answering that. First of all, cloning a vast library of millions of peptides is always going to give you a bigger library than anything that you can make synthetically. And that's the case whether you have cysteine, cysteine bridged peptides or anything else, quite frankly. But you are right to ask the question because what we would like to do is to have this methodology with the thioethers be sufficiently reliable that you can make libraries of cyclic lanthionine um, containing peptides in exactly the same way as you might have multiple epitopes synthesized on a pin or in a 96 well plate. So that gives you a smaller library, um, which might be say spatially addressable, but it gives you a library which has unnatural, um, unnatural linkages in it. Where I think, again, the size of the peptide is important. Now, 
with the thioether linked peptides, the antibiotics, again, there are two approaches. Um, there's a synth synthetic approach, which we've developed, and there's also the biosynthetic approach, which people like uh, Professor van der Donk have, um, have, have um, investigated with so much success. And he takes either the producing organism or the enzymes which do the biosynthesis of these antibiotics. And he can use those on peptides with a leader sequence to put in lanthionine rings. Now, what you're playing off here is what the enzyme will accept, which, you know, you're usually a larger peptide um, certain amino acids, but these enzymes appear to be quite flexible versus the flexibility you get with a totally synthetic approach, which will allow you to put in unnatural amino acids, in general make smaller peptides, which the enzymes might not be able to handle. So again, as with most things in chemical biology, it's a balance between what you get from the biological approach and what you get from the synthetic approach. Thank you. Any other question? People? Okay. If no more questions, um, only rest. Uh, once again, we are very grateful for the time um, you gave us for this academic activity. Thank you so much. That's all right. And thank you again for the invitation. And um, I hope one day to be able to visit Mexico in person rather than over Zoom. <laughs> I, I hope. Yeah, maybe when finish the COVID problems uh, are finished. <laughs> thank you. Sure. Um, the, the two years ago, we had one meeting from this uh, network. Uh, 60 research, have one meeting here in Mexico, in Cuernavaca. That was a very nice experience. But the, right. last year, uh, the past year, forget this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, but the next, the, um, I, I hope then the, this year, um, this year I, don't know, I don't know now if it was, if it's possible. But sure, the next year we have a, a new meeting, a presidency meeting. It's, a, it's different activity, different experience. Yeah, but, yeah. Well, this has the advantage. Thank you so much for. Yeah, it's quick. I can t I can turn up from London. I don't have to get on the plane. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah. Thank, thank you so thank much you. for the invitation. Thanks so much. Everybody, thank you, so, thank you for your attention, your presence. Uh, uh, see you soon. We are in contact by email. Uh, at yeah, the, yeah, yeah. We continue in contact. I hope. <laughs>